to Science View, where we cover the latest in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's science watcher is Dr. Eiji Mizushima from the University of Tsukuba. Hello, I'm glad to be here. And today we have an unusual guest. Yes, we are joining in the studio by a humanoid robot. Hello. Hello. Hello, we're very happy to have you here. Can you tell us why you're here? Well, I am here because today's leading edge is about the latest in humanoid robot technology. Thank you. And on J Innovators, Michelle? Japanese lacquerware is known for its unique and beautiful luster. However, it scratches easily and must be handled with care. The Takumi that I'll be introducing created a special anti-scratch coating that protects lacquerware without affecting its characteristic beauty. So let's begin with today's Science News Watch. Dr. Mizushima. A research group in Japan confirmed that upward LED lighting effectively prevented leaves from turning yellow while wilting. The study was held at a plant factory, which is an indoor facility where light and temperature control are used to grow plants all year round. The find is expected to lead to improved productivity. At plant factories, light is normally shown down onto the plants, much like it would be in nature. However, because the plants are placed close together in the facility, the leaves overlap, causing the outer ones to receive insufficient light. This leads to the leaves turning yellow or wilting. Wataru Yamori, an assistant professor at Chiba University's Center for Environment, Health and Field Sciences, led a research group to study the effect that upward LED lighting had on the production of leaf lettuce. The group confirmed that it caused the outer leaves to have two times more chlorophyll and that it prevented the leaves from dying. It also accelerated photosynthesis, causing the plant to grow faster. The final results showed that outer leaf waste was reduced by 40% and that there was an 18% increase in yield. The research group is now analyzing which light strengths and wavelengths are the most effective. Their goal is to develop a new cultivation system that will increase productivity. And what's next? It's time for the leading edge. That's right. Japan is considered a leading country in humanoid robot development. Sophisticated humanoid robots have been developed one after the other, thanks to the competition between major automobile and electronic manufacturers. Dr. Mizushima, I hear that they are on the verge of developing robots that can run and dance like humans. Yes, not too long ago, humanoid robots equal choppy movements, but now the movements are almost human-like. And these humanoid robots are now gaining worldwide attention. Yes, there has recently been an increased focus on robot development. And one of the catalysts for this was the nuclear accident that occurred during the Great East Japan earthquake. Because the nuclear power plant was contaminated with radioactive substances, robots are brought in to do the work. Yes, I remember seeing different robots being sent in, but I got the impression that they were having a rough time. Yes, and in a way, that kick-started global development of humanoid robots that could be used at nuclear accident sites and in difficult situations. Please take a look at this. This is a humanoid robot competition called Robotics Challenge, which was held in June 2015. It was organized by a research agency of the United States, Department of Defense. 25 teams from Japan, Germany, and other countries participated in the event. In the competition, the robots had to first drive a car on their own and reach the nuclear accident site. They then had to move through a rubble-strewn area with poor footing and enter the facility, open the door. It's doing a very good job. Furthermore, close a valve. 
Oops, that was unsuccessful. Rescue robots bring to mind the tank-like ones that can plow through debris. Why do we need humanoid robots? The biggest reason is that the robots will work in spaces optimized for human activity. The interior of a nuclear power plant, for example, is designed to help people work as efficiently as possible. So humanoid robots would be more effective in a place like this. I see. What's the most difficult thing about developing humanoid robots? It's probably the balance required for bipedal locomotion, which is to walk on two legs. When a robot encounters an unexpected step or slant, it needs to be able to control and maintain its balance, otherwise it will fall over. And developing this control system is extremely difficult. Take this robot, for example. It is shaped like a human, but as you may have noticed, it does not walk on two legs. How do the recent humanoid robots handle this issue? Let's take a look. A high-performance humanoid robot born from an unexpected concept can be found at this theme park. Here it is. It is 2.5 meters tall. Its movements are fluid and free from the stiffness that robots are generally known for. And that's because there is a human inside. Although some may see it as a simple mascot suit, there is more to it than that. The developer's reverse thinking led to the creation of this robot. The idea was to put a human inside to make up for the robot's lack of control. It was developed by Reiz Tatsuru Shiroku. How exactly are the robot's limbs controlled? This is called a link mechanism. The piece that is attached to the operator's arm is directly linked to the robot's arm. The operator moves their hand, the robot's hand moves in the same way. A link mechanism. It uses the principle of leverage to recreate the movements of the hands and legs on a larger scale and can be freely controlled. When the robot grips a ball, the reaction is directly communicated to the operator's hand, allowing them to even feel the ball's elasticity. Once the operator becomes accustomed to the suit, they can control it like their own arms and legs. These types of robots are called wearable robots. Research is underway to develop utilitarian wearable robots. This is a robotics development company that was established by a major household appliance manufacturer. Sensors attached to the joints detect human movement and the motor provides assistance. This robot uses powerful hydraulics to lift heavy objects and can be used to remove debris at disaster sites. It can easily lift objects that weigh over 200 kilos. Its grip strength is 100 kilos, but it can perform delicate tasks like pouring a cup of tea without spilling it. Here's one that the developers are trying to implement within the next three years. It's also a wearable robot that is a hybrid-powered suit developed to assist with manual labor. The motor assists the wearer as they begin walking, and the legs are designed to naturally move forward once the wearer establishes a walking rhythm. It can also handle running up to a speed of 10 kilometers per hour. You don't feel the weight. The machine automatically assists your movements. So it's not tiring at all. Wearable robots that assist human movement are slowly being incorporated into different workplaces. For example, at distribution centers and construction sites where heavy objects need to be lifted. Their use in agriculture and forestry is also gaining attention 
as a solution to the lack of personnel caused by an aging population. Now, Michelle is trying on a wearable robot, similar to the one we just saw in the video. It's called the Assist Suit, and it's an existing product for sale. Michelle, how does it feel? Well, it's actually lighter than I thought it would be, and the motors are designed to reduce the strain on the back. Okay, let's have you try it out. First, uh, before we turn the switch on, let's have it turned off, and please try lifting this 30 kilogram suitcase. Okay, 30 kilograms, let's go. <laughs> okay, this is really heavy. Yeah. I just can't lift it up. It looks really heavy. So next, let's turn the suit on and try again. Okay, so the switch is right here. I'm ready. Okay. Okay, so 30 kilos. I can lift it. It's really exciting. And, well, it feels as if my back is straightening on its own, like you just saw. And because my arms are not supported, naturally I do feel the weight in my arms. But still, the lower back is the base point. And because it is supported there, it's actually very comfortable. It detects the movement of the human trunk with a position sensor and the lower back motor rotates according to the operator's movement intentions. Thank you very much, Michelle, and we'll see you again later. I'll be back. Dr. Mizushima, the aging workforce is a serious issue in Japan. These technologies could solve the physical strength issue and have a lot of future potential. Yes, with this, the difficult part of balance control is managed by the operator, while the robot provides power as needed. We already have the technology for this, so it should only be a matter of time before wearable robots are widely used. That's great news, but the end goal is to create robots that can accomplish various tasks on their own. Dr. Mizushima, what kind of developments are going on right now? One would be in the field of software. Innovative robot control software was recently developed in Japan. This is a startup company in downtown Tokyo that specializes in robot development. The company has developed software that makes it possible for non-specialists to develop humanoid robots. The humanoid robot basic control software is called Wisido. It was developed by Wataru Yoshizaki. The greatest feature of the software is that anyone can use it to create and control a variety of robots, including humanoid robots, without being a professional programmer. Humanoid robots normally require extremely complicated control programming. Even to take a single step, Without proper programming, it flips over. When the foot kicks back, the reaction causes the upper body to lean forward. The weight is shifted and can no longer be supported by the sole of the foot. To prevent this and cancel out the reaction caused by the moving foot, the upper body and arms must move in the opposite direction. Until now, detailed preparations were needed to make this happen. To take one step forward, the rotation of several dozen joints throughout the body had to be carefully set in 0.05 second intervals. Without proper settings, the robot cannot even walk. And this is where the new software comes in. It automatically calculates the center of gravity in real time. All the user needs to do is provide basic movement instructions. The software will automatically move the other body parts so that the robot maintains its balance. For example, if the robot were to move its right foot, the opposite foot would be extended sideward, keeping it upright. 
The software also detects the pressure placed on each joint, making it possible for the robot to carry objects. All the difficult controls are managed by the basic software. This allows the developer to focus on what they'll use the robot for. It's amazing that the things people do unconsciously are instantaneously digitalized and reproduced. One outstanding feature of this control software is that it can be applied to a variety of robots. Take a look at this. Wow, it's changing shape. Precisely. Even this robot, which has very complicated movements, uses the software. Although the center of gravity shifts in complicated ways, it firmly maintains its balance. And next, we have a big robot that is four meters tall. It's been used in sci-fi films before. This big robot also uses the same basic control software, so it can be controlled by anyone. That was really amazing. So with one complete control software, you can assign different robots to different jobs. Exactly. The developer said that in computer terms, this is the equivalent of an operating system. Experiments are currently being held to see how the software can be used in developing multipurpose humanoid robots. This is a construction site in Saga Prefecture, which is located in the Kyushu region. A new project was underway to expand the potential of humanoid robots. In the back seat of the car is a humanoid robot. What job will this delicate looking robot be able to perform at a construction site? The robot is carried to the operator's seat in a power shovel. The power shovel itself is quite ordinary. The robot grips the control levers. It's prepared to operate the machine. The actual operator is seated in front of a screen a short distance away and is controlling the robot remotely. When the operator moves his arms, the robot's arms move as well and push the levers down. It expertly digs up the dirt. This robot is designed to be used in disaster zones, for example, to dig up rubble after landslides. With humanoid robots like this one, rescue missions can begin immediately in areas at risk of a secondary disaster. Our goal is to be able to control them from our operation center and have them work in disaster areas that people can't enter, and also at construction sites. We already have heavy machines that can be operated by remote control, but this robot can operate regular heavy machinery. Yes, as long as there is someone to operate the humanoid robot, then people don't need to set foot in actual place. In a way, it transcends space. In agriculture, this makes it possible for farmers to pick apples while sitting in the house and listening to music. I was wondering if humanoid robots were really needed, but I now understand that their human shape helps them to work seamlessly with humans. That's because the environment we live in was designed for human activity. If humanoid robots that can move freely in these spaces are developed, then I believe robots will become a bigger part of society and radically change the way we live and work. Technology wasn't that advanced before, but now we are reaching the point where it's a very likely possibility. Japanese traditional craft, the lacquerware. The unique and beautiful glossy finish is made by applying lacquer on wood or on synthetic resin numerous times. And a 
technique made by mixing silver powder with lacquer is called tamamushi yuri. It is becoming popular in many countries for its delicate gleam under dim lighting. Mmm, it's delicious. Hello, I'm Michelle. This glass has been coated with tamamushi lacquer. As you can see, the iridescent lacquer can be applied to glass. And it shines like the wings of a jewel beetle, which is how I got its name. It's beautiful, isn't it? However, lacquerware needs to be washed with extra special care as its surfaces are easily scratched. Today's Takumi Innovator came up with a special coating agent which makes up for its weakness. Let's go meet him. We visited a lacquerware studio in Sendai City, Miyagi Prefecture, where Tamamushi lacquer started. Hello. Hello. I'm Michelle Yamamoto. I'm Saura. Our Takumi today is Yasuhiro Saura, a lacquerware craftsman. Saura's company was first established in 1933 by his grandfather, Motojiro. The sales increased steadily and became the biggest lacquerware manufacturer in Sendai City. Since early childhood, lacquerware was a part of the life of Saura. What is it that you're doing here? I am applying a strong coating agent to prevent it from scratches. What the Takumi is applying on the finished lacquerware is a special coating agent. By coating with the agent, it becomes more durable while preserving its beauty. Let's look at its durability. This is a sheet with tamamushi lacquer. The left one is before coating, and the right one is after it's coated. To evaluate, we prepared a 2H pencil with lead as hard as a human nail. We applied a force of 750 grams and slid it on the surface. As a result, the sheet without the coating got scratches, but the one with the coating had none. There was a reason for the Takumi to develop this coating agent. It was the Great East Japan Earthquake that occurred in 2011. Sendai City, where the studio is situated, was shaken by an enormous earthquake. It was not directly affected by the incident, but later on, it was gradually and indirectly affected. The number of tourists declined sharply, and we lost sales from tourists. So after much thought, we decided to seek markets overseas. In 2013, the Takumi put tamamushi lacquerware on display at an exhibition held in Germany. But from Western users who sought practical tableware, he was told of its weakness and that it wasn't compatible to dishwashers and got easily scratched. So Saura decided to develop a new coating agent. There are two types of coating agents normally used for lacquerware. Organic coating for synthetic resin and inorganic coating containing clay and minerals. Organic coating had a weakness that it is incompatible with tamamushi lacquer and it peels off easily. On the other hand, inorganic coating is durable and does not peel off easily, but the temperature control for its application is difficult and the price was expensive. Then if both organic and inorganic coatings were mixed together, it could make up for its faults and develop a new coating agent. With that idea in mind, Saura went to seek for joint development with a national research institute, but it wasn't so easy. We tried using a composite we developed, using organic and inorganic materials, on top of tamamushi lacquer. But the material deteriorated the original beauty of the tamamushi lacquer. When the composite is just merely mixed together, the two ingredients do not mix evenly, and the light reflection diffuses, which negates the distinctive glossiness of tamamushi lacquer. 
So as a key ingredient to evenly mix the composites, they set their eyes on surface active agents. To mix organic and inorganic components together, a surface active agent is used. After trying out different surface active agents, they have found that the unevenness can be improved by certain surface active agents. Also, after trying hundreds of different combinations of organic and inorganic components and surface active agents, they found a perfect match that mixes the components evenly while at the same time rids diffused reflection. And the organic and inorganic nanocomposite coating was finally complete. The glossy shine of the tamamushi lacquer was preserved, and at the same time, a high durability was achieved. If I was to be too particular about tradition, I wouldn't have gone forth with new development. I believe that in manufacturing, one must continuously create with flexibility to fit the times. I brought some of the Takumi's lacquerware. Please take a look. Wow, they're beautiful. You know, when washing lacquerware like these, you normally have to use a soft sponge and be very careful. But with these, you can even put them in the dishwasher. I definitely want them. Because they are scratch resistant, they will last longer and you will be able to enjoy them for a long time. Yes. And in the future, the Takumi wants to go beyond tableware and apply tamamushi lacquer to architectural and automotive interiors. Thank you very much, Michelle. So, Dr. Mizushima, how would you wrap up today's topic? Humanoid robots have evolved rapidly in the past few years. What was science fiction when I was a child is now on the verge of becoming reality. In the future, Robots will undoubtedly play a bigger role in our everyday lives. In addition to helping us with physical tasks, they could provide a sense of security. The day may come when, just like cars, there will be a robot in almost every home. Thank you, Dr. Mizushima. And that's all for today. Did you enjoy the show? Thank you for watching Science View. Goodbye.